I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. We're so happy to have you joining us today for our event, Vital Directions for Health and Healthcare, Priorities for 2021. Health Affairs is pleased to hold this event in conjunction with the National Academy of Medicine, which operates under a congressional charter dating back to 1863. We published online the day after the inauguration and then published in print in February, six papers arising from the Vital Directions Project. You'll hear a lot more about that project, but it sets a course and agenda for a new administration to follow and take uh, advice from over the coming four years. Today's program is outstanding. You'll hear from a collection of policymakers and leaders in the field who will discuss the recommendations within the various papers and help us understand how to turn the great thinking behind those papers into the reality of better health and health care. It's my pleasure now to turn the microphone over to Dr. Victor Zhao, President of the National Academy of Medicine. Victor. Thank you, Alan. I'm Victor Zhao, the President of the National Academy of Medicine, and I thank you all for joining us for this uh, virtual briefing. Uh, I do want to thank Alan, my partner in crime, and Health Affairs for partnering with us on this very important uh, briefing. I want to give you a little history behind this. In 2016, in anticipation of the U.S. presidential election and forthcoming new administration, the National Academy of Medicine launched a strategic initiative to marshal expert guidance on pressing health and healthcare priorities. This was an initiative co-chaired by Mark McClellan and myself, but it was overseen by a steering committee of experts. And we had the foresight to bring the very best bipartisan former leaders, such as Bill Frist, Mark McClellan, Tom Dasho, Mike Levitt, Ellis Suhuni, Peggy Hamburg, and others. We engaged 150 experts and wrote 19 articles on the important topics in health and healthcare. It was published as Vital Directions, now we call it 2.1, uh, 1.0, pardon me, in JAMA, and the papers provide a trusted evidence-based analysis of critical issues in health and healthcare and biomedical sciences. You know, Vital Directions 1.0 is particularly important in engaging Congress during the debate on repeal of the Affordable Care Act. Now, since 2016, uh, that publication, much has happened in health and medicine, including declining life expectancy in US, certainly in certain segments of population, deaths of despair, opioid crisis, maternal mortality, COVID-19, of course, and pervasive health inequalities or inequities, among others. So building on the initial vital directions effort, we complete a more focused but important and updated assessment of the key priorities and issues of urgent attention for the new Biden administration. We brought together 30 experts to address high priority issues that have a particularly compelling need for attention with each article reviewing trends, trends and analysis of the challenge and potential actions. As you hear, they include Healthcare, health costs and financing challenges, optimizing health and well being for women and children, transforming mental health and addiction services, actualizing better health and healthcare for the older adults, infectious disease threats and outbreaks, particularly COVID 19, and the disproportionate negative impact on health inequities on the vulnerable and underserved populations. As you heard in February, these papers were published in Health Affairs under an issue called Vital Directions for Health and Healthcare Priorities for 2021. And we're here today with experts, health leaders, policy makers to discuss the findings of these papers. I do wanna point out that there's another vital direction which is not covered in our series. And it's critically important. It is of course, climate change and human health. Climate change is one of the biggest existential threats facing humanity. The health effects of a challenging climate are overwhelmingly negative. At the NAM, we recognize the vital importance of attending to effects of climate on health. 
and the December issue of Health Affairs was dedicated solely to this topic. We strongly support the findings and the recommended recommendations for actions. So following the release of Vital Directions publication, we now are ready and eager to partner with the Biden administration to address the urgent policy issues in the five vital directions, just as we're also working actively with the administration on the sixth vital direction, which is climate change and human health. I want to point out that underlying all these health challenges, this is a cross-cutting theme of disproportionate negative impact of health inequities on vulnerable and underserved populations, which underscore the compelling need to address the root cause of systemic racism. As the Vital Direction Report concluded that, quote, health equity is the most important Vital Direction for 2021. So we are at an unprecedented juncture to make progress on these critically important topics. We want to make sure they have impact. This is why we brought together major leaders today for a discussion on the key policy recommendations of the articles and their implications for Biden administration and the overall health community. Thank you very much. Let me now turn the meeting over to my good friend, Dr. Mike McGinnis, who's the Executive Officer of National Academy of Medicine. Thank you very much, uh, Victor and Alan. Uh, it's a, a tremendous pleasure to uh, be with uh, all of those involved <laughs> in the production of Vital Directions. I'm going to go uh, provide a little context um, uh, through some graphics uh, that will revisit the important themes that uh, Victor mentioned. Uh, as he said, I'm the executive officer of the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, and if I can have the next slide, please. Um, which I can't see, but uh, I assume it's the map of the US. Uh, and it indicates that uh, from a quote with, uh, from Vital Directions, that U.S. healthcare has reached a critical inflection point. The climate in health uh, care is ripe for meaningful change. Essentially, this reflects the fact that for the, the first two decades of the 21st century, a number of pressures, good and bad, were growing uh, that emphasized the need to draw attention uh, and stimulate action uh, to address them. Some of them were good, uh, the growth in technologies at the high end, for example, that could be applied in a number of increasingly marvelous ways uh, to provide public health and uh, clinical interventions. And at the low end, uh, in some ways, uh, provide uh, uh, better access to people uh, everywhere uh, to be engaged in their health. Much uh, of that potential has yet to be uh, achieved, but nonetheless, the developments were encouraging. On the other hand, the gap between rich and poor continued to increase. As Victor mentioned, there were, it was actually a turnaround in the life expectancy rates among certain groups. The costs of care continued their inexorable growth, squeezing out uh, potential for investments in other parts of the economy and, and in the social services necessary for those who are most in need. Uh, the uh, importance of ensuring that uh, the relationship between health and medical, public health and medical care became more acute as the issues uh, that linked the two in terms of the future health of the nation began to strain with the weakness of public health. Uh, COVID and the last year has shown a very strong spotlight on those challenges. Uh, and as Victor mentioned, especially indicated the vulnerability of much of our population and accentuated the problems of public health, uh, of the, uh, of the um, uh, those who are uh, on the margins of our society and made it more clear that we have to change. Next slide, please. Uh, we had a very, uh, a steering committee, as Victor mentioned, uh, uh, already uh, from the 2017 it, uh, version of uh, the Vital Directions, the first iteration. Senator Frist and Mark McClellan, who are on this panel, were here, as Victor mentioned, and there are a number of other steering com uh, committee members who are on the line, and thank you very much to each of you. 
the three arenas that we're focused on in the first vital directions are better health and well-being, high value healthcare, strong science and technology. And the 150 authors and 19 papers that were developed provide a very strong base for action across the board. Therefore, it was logical for us as uh, an academy to look in spe specifically uh, at the key issues that have been the focus of Vital Directions 2.0. Next slide, please. In the first edition, there were action priorities identified uh, and infrastructure priorities identified. The action priorities were pay for value, empower people, activate communities, and connect care, each of which an important mandate in order to achieve the vision of the vital directions effort, uh, across the board, and that is a health system that performs optimal in promoting, protecting, and restoring the health of individuals and populations and helps each person reach their full potential for health and well being. Along with those action priorities, some key infrastructure challenges were underscored as well. The importance of our measuring what matters most, the importance uh, of modernizing our skill uh, uh, set uh, in our health professionals, uh, the importance of accelerating real world evidence, and the importance of advancing science. Next slide, please. After the issuance of the Vital Directions uh, 1.0 framework, we moved into a variety of uh, implementation efforts, including moving to the state. Uh, the action occurs at the state and local level, and that's become ever more apparent, especially throughout the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And we see here an example of a 2019 pilot that we had in North Carolina around uh, Vital Directions. The next slide, please. As Victor mentioned, uh, the Vital Directions priorities for uh, 2021 um, had us undertaking a deep dive on the issue of costs and financing, on the issue of optimizing the well being of women and children, on the issue of transforming uh, mental health and addiction services, uh, on the issue of infectious disease threats, uh, and on the issue of uh, improving the prospects. Uh, health and well being for older adults. Next slide, please. As you heard from Alan and Victor in the February uh, issue of Health Affairs, the, these five reports, along with an overview report, uh, were, uh, were released. Uh, and next slide, please. Uh, I'd like to underscore one element in particular. If you look at the overview of the uh, that's printed in Health Affairs, you'll see uh, a headline. And the headline in many ways uh, is a clarion call for all of us. And that is health equity, the most vital direction for 2021. As we assessed some of the common themes in each of the papers, it was very clear uh, that health equity uh, is a clear and present danger. Uh, health inequity is a clear and present danger to too many of our population. Uh, and if we're going to succeed in reaching the vision uh, of Vital Directions, uh, it's a first and foremost priority for us. So as we uh, move from context uh, into the opportunities, beginning with Secretary Sebelius, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors uh, in the Vital Directions effort, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, the John A. Hartford Foundation, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and turn it back over to you, Victor. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, thank you. Okay, I'm now unmuted. Thank you, Michael, for setting the stage. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our opening keynote, the Honorable Kathleen Sebelius. She, of course, does not need any introduction. But uh, Kathleen Sebelius is one of America's most formal experts on national and global health issues, human services, and of course, executive, direct, uh, executive leadership. As CEO of Civilis Resources, she provides strategic advice to companies, investors, and nonprofit organizations. From April 2009 
through June 2014. Secretary Sebelius served as President Obama's cabinet as the 21st Secretary of Department of Health and Human Services, where she worked to pass and implement the Affordable Care Act. Honorable Captain Sebelius served as Governor of Kansas from 2003 until a cabinet appointment in April 2009, and was named one of America's top five governors by Time Magazine. So please join me in welcoming the Honorable Kathleen Sebelius to deliver the opening keynote remarks. Well, thank you so much, Victor, for inviting me to join the National Academy of Medicine today. And thanks for that gracious introduction. I'm not sure that my mother didn't write that, but um, I appreciate it. Uh, Victor is a great leader of the National Academy, as well as a colleague on the Aspen Health Strategy Group, a strategic thinker who not only helps to identify challenges, but always works to find solutions and partners. I'm glad you'll be hearing from Bill Frist, who's a friend, a colleague, a healthcare provider, a former policymaker, and one of the great leaders in rethinking health in America. And I'm very proud of Lauren Underwood, who worked with me at Health and Human Services. She did great work then, but watching her become a leader in the effort to combat maternal mortality, be elected to Congress and speak out has truly been inspiring. Uh, always a shout out to the distinguished editor in chief of health affairs, Alan Weil, and the panel he'll moderate, as well as the recognition of the articles he has published. Uh, there are great thinkers involved in the conversation today. Many of you uh, listening to this dialogue uh, have been involved and engaged in identifying these priorities and uh, the solutions. Uh, and I'm encouraged about the opportunities to educate, motivate, but more importantly, mobilize some real action on the issues identified. In 1966, 55 years ago, in a speech to the Convention of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. told the audience that, quote, of all forms of inequality, Injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane, end quote. Shame on us that we continue to have the same conversation about healthcare in America today. But thank you to NAM for identifying health equity as our most urgent issue, providing really a unifying theme in the five priority challenges addressed in vital directions. And we gather today on the first anniversary of the WHO declaring COVID-19 as a health emergency and quote, a probable pandemic. One year later, we're in what we all hope might be the final chapter of our great national nightmare. The failure of America to protect our citizens from death and economic chaos in a pandemic is shocking and grim. Of the two and a half million lives lost around the globe, 20% occurred here in America. And what the COVID-19 data highlights is America's health inequalities. Life expectancy, as Victor said, has dropped a full year for all Americans, but by almost three years for Black Americans. Now, the attention of the American public is focused in a way that decades of reports could never achieve. They've seen the gaping holes in our health system, deaths in Black and Brown communities, which far exceed population numbers, and have actually learned a daily lesson about the intimate connection between health and our economy and prosperity, that America can't be a resilient, prosperous country without being a healthy country. And that does give me some real hope for the future. Doing a better job responding to inf infectious disease is critical and begins with ground up resilience, focused on the least healthy and most vulnerable communities at a local level. We have unfortunately a grim roadmap from a year of COVID illnesses and deaths. And unless we tackled health disparities at a community level, expand access, improve quality, invest in social drivers of health, no top-down expenditure on stockpiles, vaccines and treatments will erase the impact of infectious disease on an already vulnerable population. But this is a possible post 9-11 moment for population health. And the same urgency and attention to building security resilience 
is required now for health resilience. And Senator Patty Murray, who chairs the Health Committee, just introduced legislation, which I think provides some great framework and a starting point for and NAM engagement. Confronting the huge gaps in healthcare access must include an honest assessment of the massive underserved population dealing with mental health and substance use issues. Removing stigma for providers, patients and workforce is, a, is an important starting point. Mental health care is healthcare, not a carve out or an add on. And addiction is a health disease, not a criminal offense. Now, those issues were part of our pre-COVID health challenges. But what experts know is that mental health impacts of any disaster far outlive the physical damage and can affect individuals for years. The waves of silent grief and loss for lives, for jobs and home, for friendships and social connections will require an even stronger integrated network of health care. The tsunami of trauma as individuals emerge from lockdown will affect all ages and incomes, and we need to recognize that full recovery won't be possible until all individuals are able to find health. And the COVID era advances of telehealth for mental health services is critical to continue and expand access and affordability. Health providers should actively press policymakers to finally declare the war on drugs an enormously expensive failure that has wrecked far too many lives and families, particularly in Black communities. As we expand services for substance use issues, it's critical to also press for a change in laws, adjusting sentences, expunging records, and assisting individuals rebuilding lives without a criminal record. The graying of America is here and 11,000 baby boomers turn 65 every day and most want to age in place. The sheer numbers are staggering, requiring a massive new workforce. Advances in palliative care, hospice service and community supports need to be accelerated and provider training and expansion must change to meet the moment. I think there's a real urgency about rewriting government programs written in the mid 60s, which pay for and support senior health. They're currently divided between state and federal government, between Medicaid and Medicare. Medicare often lacks the benefit and support services needed uh, for an aging population. And Medicaid pays for services only for the lowest income population. Those programs need to be integrated and rethought so they serve the senior population that we're facing. I began working on children and family issues 35 years ago when I entered the Kansas legislature as a mother of young children. My kids were two and five and I was trying to balance parenting and work. And now that my daughters-in-law are working moms with young children, I realize just how little progress has been made as a country investing in children and their mothers. It should be declared a national health emergency that the US has a rising maternity, maternal mortality rate. And I'm constantly shocked to find out how few people even know this fact. Now, I know you're gonna hear from Congresswoman Underwood, a national expert on this topic, but I am joining her call, urging the healthcare provider community to call for policy and provider changes, paid parental leave, safe, affordable childcare, expanded access for mothers to choose appropriate maternal healthcare. The good news is few children have become terribly ill or died from COVID, but the terrible toll this disease has taken on children is gonna take decades to overcome. And the most serious impact has fallen on poor and minority children. And here's what we know. We know most of the 525,000 deaths impacted children who lost elders they love. We know that 20 million children now live in households where someone lost a job. We know that 14 million children don't have enough to eat every day. And that's almost three times the rate of food insecurity from 2018. 30% of those children are black and 25% are Hispanic. And we know that the gaps in tech and safe housing and support has made remote school much more difficult 
particularly for low income children, forcing some mothers out of the workforce who are unable to balance schoolwork for their kids and work for themselves. This is a moment to get focused and get to work. If black lives truly matter, if children are our most important resource, we have a crisis. And we know the solutions are within reach because they're in place in other countries in the world. Focus spending from the state and federal government on mothers and children is a long overdue investment, not an expenditure. And congratulations to Congress the, for including provisions in the Rescue Act addressing child poverty. But unfortunately, they're temporary and discussion has to begin right away to make those investments permanent and add change policy. And finally, the topic of healthcare spending and financing is a looming challenge but not a zero sum game. Other countries currently spend $2 on social determinants on health for every dollar they spend on clinical healthcare. America spends 50 cents on social supports for every dollar in healthcare. While we spend more, America has more uninsured and some of the worst health outcomes of any developed country. And if we seriously want to address health equity, this challenge is critical. We've learned a hard lesson that America can't be a prosperous, safe country unless we're a healthy country. It's time we stop talking about costs and begin thinking about long-term investments, starting with the sickest and poorest communities. The National Academy of Medicine call to action to focus on these five priority areas within the framework of eliminating health inequity and with the lessons learned from COVID comes at a pivotal time for America. There has never been a more important time for healthcare providers to engage within your own communities, with patients and local leaders, with experts and legislators at the state level to influence the policy of the state you live in, and with members of Congress and the new administration. But I would be remiss if I didn't call for action right away. The Biden administration has opened and expanded enrollment period for the Affordable Care Act. This is a policy that could help millions of Americans achieve health care access right away. The open enrollment period lasts until May 15th, and the Rescue Act includes lots of provisions to help people afford that insurance coverage. There are more generous subsidies up and down the income scale. There are provisions for people who are unemployed to obtain free health coverage. There are opportunities for people to have their COBRA coverage paid for, but folks have to know it's around and the healthcare provider community is the perfect voice to help spread the word. Healthcare.gov continues as a good place to go for enrollment information. But again, this time period is lasts only until the 15th of May and could help to ensure two to three million additional Americans right away. So I want to again thank the National Academy for including me. Uh, thanks to your great efforts. And I look forward to working along with all of you to achieve uh, progress on these vital priorities. Well, thank you so much, Kathleen. I mean, such a thoughtful assessment of the nation's health condition <clears throat> and a really compelling message particularly on issues of child support, health inequities, and so many others. And your call to action. I'm truly inspired by your message. We thank you so much for joining us. I know that we don't have everybody here. We have 1,500 people watching, so I'm going to give you a round of applause this way. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. I know you have to go. So thank you again very much for your words. Thank you. <clears throat> now, it's my... Also a great pleasure to introduce a good friend and uh, a special speaker that is in fact, Senator Bill Frist. Um, doctor and Senator. William Frist is a national acclaimed heart and lung transplant surgeon. I know that well because I'm a cardiologist and although we didn't overlap at Stanford and also in Boston, but of course, his reputation precedes him as a surgeon and a great health leader. 
but as you all know him as former U.S. Senate Majority Leader. And of course, during his time, I would say those were the really great heydays. And he's the founding partner of Frisk Cressy Ventures and chairman of the Executive Council of Health Service Investment from Chrissy and Company. Senator Fritz is actively involved with business as well as the medical, humanitarian, and philanthropic communities. Um, he's the chairman of both Hope Through Healing Hands, which focuses on maternal and child health and global poverty, and SCORE, a statewide collaborative education reform organization has helped propel Tennessee to prominence as a K-12 education reform state. And of course, he's a good friend and a role model. So please join me in welcoming Senator Frist. Over to you. Victor, thank you very much. And it's a delight for me to, to be with um, our, our, our audience today and uh, look forward to the panel later. In the next few minutes, I do want to wear the multiple hats that you mentioned, that of a, a doctor, a physician who's been deeply involved in the acute clinical care as a surgeon doing heart transplants every week, year after year, and also chronic care, the managing of chronic heart failure and chronically immunosuppressed patients. Uh, the head of a policymaker, um, sensitive to the extreme and harsh partisanship, uh, the reality, as we all know, of today's Congress, recognizing that for the near to midterm future, there is likely to be no compromise on any major structural reform in health policy. The head of, a, as you mentioned, a builder of health service solutions through venture capital. And uh, that's the venture capital private equity world. You know, a lot of people just dismiss it, push it to the side, but it is where innovation and the flow of capital, especially today in health, health services, um, health and well being, is extraordinarily resilient and rampant. It's big and it's responsive. And then, as Kathleen sort of set up, and as Victor did as well, on this whole issue of health equity as an active board member at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where health equity and, and vulnerable populations has become uh, the centerpiece. You know, I can summarize what, what I'm about to say by stating that from the perspective of having worn and wearing all of those hats, I believe that there is one, a single central organizing, central sphere of influence that will have the single most impactful, and I would say even the most powerful incremental impact on accelerating faster progress in all of the five fields, uh, the five papers, but the five fields that we highlight today, reducing healthcare costs, child and maternal health, behavioral health, reaching seniors, identifying the spread of infectious disease. And the pandemic uh, over the last year has thrust upon us the awareness and I would argue, I would argue equally important, the cultural acceptance and application of this game changing sphere of influence. So what is it? It's the explosive adoption, I believe, of telemedicine and virtual care, care that is more convenient, more affordable, delivered remotely in real time that reaches children and mothers and seniors and frail elderly and vulnerable populations in ways that none of us, none of the 1,500 people listing right now thought possible just 12 months ago, just 12 months ago. When we think of telemedicine as a relatively recent in, uh, invention or innovation only made possible by the internet and, and smartphones, not really. I had my first taste of it 60 years ago. As a boy in the 1960s, I witnessed my dad, a physician, reading from our home, not too far from where I'm sitting now, in the middle of the night, really night after night, several times a week, emergency EKGs 60 years ago, sent over the old analog telephone lines from clinics, faraway clinics in, in remote Tennessee. And then years later in the 1980s, I relied on telemedicine, as Victor mentioned in my own practice, as I personally managed the chronic immunosuppression, the immunosuppressive care of all of the heart transplant patients and the lung transplant patients that I transplanted over about a 14-year period. And then while I was in the Senate two decades ago, I and our, my colleagues worked to build programs establishing T1 lines 20 years ago to Native American reservations to provide 
that remote, critical, virtual, real-time care to those remote regions that otherwise had zero, zero access. And today, as a board member, heavily involved with virtual care on the business side and, and the board and the leadership side of Teladoc Health, which is sort of the domestic, the largest domestic and global leader. It covers 50 million people, for example, Teladoc Health, access to telemedicine, as well as other companies on the board of a highly disruptive teledentistry, teledentistry company called Smile Direct. So telemedicine, and by that I mean telehealth, remote monitoring and virtual care eliminates patient travel, it improves access, it saves time, and it smartly distributes and redistributes its workforce in real time and then moves care closer to the home. So if, if we look at our five focus areas, I'll just run through and give some examples uh, as we go through. Health cost. It's no secret we spend more on healthcare than any other developed nation. And, and we all know in the aggregate, in the aggregate, our outcomes are, are poor. Administrative costs account for 15 to 30% of overall healthcare spend. And we all know half of that is probably wasted or at least unnecessary. Much of the administrative overhead and the bricks and mortar cost of in-person visits, think the nursing, the checking in, the getting there, the insurance behind all of that, is eliminated with virtual health or telehealth. Hospital care, hugely expensive. We all know the pie charts. Getting appropriate care closer to the home is cost effective. Advancing home-based care is, is a fundamental lever we have learned over the last 12 months to rein in the true cost and telemedicine, the, 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 and it can be by text, it can be by video, it can be by telephone, but telemedicine is the tool to accomplish that. You know, why wait two weeks? And that's being generous for a doctor's visit. Bad things can happen, especially when you've got a problem. Well, dialing from home at 10 o'clock at night, wherever you are today is easy. In fact, most of, of the dominant telemedicine uh, companies out there today can connect you, you right now, on screen, by phone, by text, by video, to a board certified physician within 15 minutes. That's access. So when we look at these spheres, we need to jump into the world where we are today, not a year ago, not five years ago, and that is virtual care, faster diagnosis means less progression of disease and earlier diagnosis typically means less cost. Emergency rooms, expensive. We all know many people use it as primary care because they're underinsured or they don't have insurance or they don't have other access. Telehealth has the potential and it's been demonstrated to divert to appropriate sites of care, generally less expensive, 20 to 30% of all emergency room visits. In expensive, inconvenient visits to these more cost-effective sites. Chronic disease, it does account for most of our, our healthcare costs today. And you look at a company like Livongo Health, a digital health pioneer and leader, has shown that 20% reduction in cost in things like diabetic care, all with outcomes that are equal or, or better, or actually better than, than quality. Think of remote digital monitoring of your blood sugar or weight gain for heart failure in my, in my transplant patients. All of these are warning signs before the patient really gets sick. And it's all made possible today by telemedicine and telehealth. Our second entry is, is that we're looking at is on early childhood and maternal health. And again, all, a lot of these blend together, but just recently I spoke to Dr. Sarah Hamitsky who, from Pittsburgh and, and she runs a, a really state-of-the-art, a really neat one-of-a-kind nationally recognized clinics for perinatal mental health. And what she told me was that within a month of transitioning to telehealth visits for their new and expectant mothers, they saw a 10% drop in no-show cancellation rates among what some people would say is a challenging population, the Medicaid population. Just remarkable, 10% just in bringing on the virtual component. You know, many of the barriers to making a child's visit for an expected mother um, or an expected mother or, or for both of, of, of moms and, and children, they've got to take off work, they've got to find child care, they've got to find the transportation, they have the travel time with <clears throat> effectively well-organized tele telehealth, <clears throat> all of that goes away. And remember, telehealth is not just video like we're doing now. But it can be by telephone, the way I've done telemedicine for 20 years or 40 years. 
or even by the increasingly popular single text messaging, which increasingly is probably the fastest growing part of, 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 of virtual health today. The third category, mental health and, and addiction, you know, it's already been said and Kathleen said it, the pandemic has laid bare the mental health crisis our nation, not just during the pandemic has faced, but has long been facing, as well as that woefully inadequate resources we've devoted to it. And it's the provider shortages, it's the inadequate insurance coverage, just the social stigma, um, all exacerbated by the dire situation of the pandemic and demand has skyrocketed. We were already outstripping, the demand was already outstripping our supply, but we've outstripped our infrastructure, our bricks and mortar infrastructure and supply as well. I was looking this morning, the Kaiser Family Foundation found that nearly 119 million Americans live in mental health shortage areas, a region, a shortage. Only 27% of the need is being met. The Council, the National Council of, of Behavioral Health reported that 77% or three fourths of the counties in the United States are experiencing a severe, severe shortage of mental health providers. Well, virtual care and telehealth delivery has the opportunity to seamlessly and instantly address these mental health care deserts, the linkage the matching of the workforce in real time where the demand is instead of having the geographic barriers. The virtual health and the telemedicine greatly expand the effective, the active, the effective workforce matching that patient to provider. We've all seen this, this explosion in behavioral health services, but just so, if I share it with my audience, if you look at Better Health, Talkspace, American Well, MD Live, Teladoc, in all of those, the single fastest growing component of these independent telemedicine companies is behavioral and mental health. Our fourth category is better care for seniors. The AARP tells us that 90% of people over the age of 65 wanna stay in their home. And with the vulnerabilities that we've seen and brought to light with long-term care facilities this year, it's imperative we find solutions and alternatives and virtual care can do that. Virtual care with remote delivery I'll have to throw in also includes social determinants of health care, also that have come on the forefront as we all realize how important they are to health and well being. One company called Pure Foods or Mom's Meals will deliver to the homes of Medicaid patients and the frail elderly over 50 million medically tailored meals, meals that are specifically and medically tailored to their condition diabetes, heart failure, kidney disease. And, and with our older populations who are, who are more likely to suffer from a chronic condition, imagine if a doctor has the ability to monitor remotely, not in their doctor's offices, but the key vital signs over time. A patient with hypertension or high blood pressure, instead of adjusting treatment, which the doctors do today, on a single blood pressure reading in an office at one point in time, can have a continual virtually uh, and digitally uh, uh, transported reading every single day or three times a day or 10 times a day. It's better science. It means costly uh, emergency room visits can be eliminated, hospital stays eliminated, emergency surgical procedures eliminated, better outcomes and better health. And lastly, infectious disease. You know, it was the COVID-19 virus that, that has been the accelerant. The, it has been the accelerant and infectious disease has been the accelerant that in six months, advanced virtual health care by more than six years, in six months. As, as Kathleen said, and Victor restated, responsible government, I put my policy hat on, uh, really matters. Thanks to the, the quick and effective and robust federal response, the federal regulatory changes happened. Providers from around the country who've been isolating in their home were able to provide care remotely and virtually for the first time ever, and we're reimbursed for it for the first time ever. Nationwide patients sheltering in place who were at home as we all were, could still see their physicians virtually. The transition was made quickly. That reduced the burden on the systems which were overloaded, overloaded with COVID, and we saw that play out in New York. And all the time, people were socially distanced, avoiding viral spread. And Americans' health systems notoriously really slow, as we all know, to change, radically transformed their approach to care, to virtual care with lightning speed, in large part driven by that government lowering those barriers. So government does matter. 
and again, right now, as Kathleen mentioned, must act soon, and I believe it will. Telemedicine is one of the areas, I said up front, we're not gonna see a lot of bipartisan support, and I condemn it, I hate it, it makes me sad, but telemedicine is the one area of strong bipartisan support. And Kathleen mentioned we need to allow telehealth access regardless of patient and provider location. We need to address cross-state licensing barriers, continue reimbursement. So I've gone on long enough. It's a, you know, we've experienced a seismic shift in, in this culture of telehealth. telehealth. And I, I really want to sort of underscore it's the culture that has changed for the provider and the recipient. The old 12 month ago, 2020 culture of doubt of fears around privacy, of um, inadequate reimbursement, fears of the unknown has now, has now been replaced by a culture of confidence and trust, a, a culture which underscores and values convenience and affordability and rapid access to quality care, where you need it and when you need it, all this in the safe environment uh, of home. Very last thing, it, it was, uh, Victor Zhao will remember it, and, and we've talked about it recently, it was four years ago to this week, exactly to this week, that, that Dr. Zhao and I went from office to office in Washington on Capitol Hill, sharing the vital directions report that, that Michael and others have, have, have outlined uh, earlier with the House leadership, the Senate leadership. We explained why investing smartly in healthcare and public health needed, should be, deserved to be a top priority. What we hope to convince policymakers of then is even more true today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, oops. Great, thank you so much. And Sun, I look forward to go, to go to the Capitol with you again, taking this vital directions to people at Congress. Uh, by the way, I think your message of innovation using telehealth and connected care is what the Vital Direction is all about. As I'm thinking about what you're saying, you're so right. I mean, by taking this opportunity to change the way we do healthcare, particularly in telehealth, it not only reduces the cost of care but it brings care much closer to community, to the population. But let me add in the, the climate piece. As you think about moving from disease intervention to telehealth, the carbon emission will go down and we'll be doing our job also in the climate change side. So thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Victor. <clears throat> so let me, um, it's a great honor for me to introduce Congressman woman, Lauren Underwood, whom I admire. She serves in Illinois' 14th Congressional District, has sworn into the 116th U.S. Congress on January 3rd, 2019. She's the first woman, the first person of color, and the first millennial to represent her community in Congress. She's also the youngest African-American woman to serve the United States House of Representatives. Congressman Women Underwood serves on the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, the House Committee on Appropriations. In addition, she co-founded and co-chairs the Black Maternal Health Caucus, which elevates Black maternal health crises within Congress and advances policy solutions to improve maternal health outcomes and end disparities. I mean, it is really quite amazing in my mind that in fact, we have our work resonate and we have a champion in Congress to look at maternal health, look at health inequities, et cetera. So please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Women Underwood. Well, good afternoon. I am so delighted to be with you for this important event on the National Academy of Medicine's Vital Directions for Health and Healthcare in 2021. I'd like to thank Dr. Victor Zhao and Alan Weil for hosting today's conversation. And I would also like to acknowledge my fellow keynote speakers, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius and Senator Bill Frist for their decades of leadership in healthcare quality, access and equity in the United States and globally. We are gathered virtually for this discussion nearly one year to the day that full scale shutdown swept across the United States, 
as the coronavirus began to spread throughout our communities. In the months that have followed, we've seen the very best in our nation's healthcare system, starting with our nurses, doctors, and other healthcare workers who've been on the front lines of this crisis, saving lives in the most difficult circumstances imaginable. We've also seen the limitless possibilities for biomedical breakthroughs when we fully mobilize the resources of the federal government in support of innovative private sector partners, leading to the development of three safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines already with more in the pipeline. But despite these achievements, we know the past 12 months have also shined a bright light on the structural problems in our healthcare system that long predated COVID-19. The issues identified by the Academy of Medicine as priorities for 2021, from the health and well being of mothers and children to mental health and addiction services to healthcare access and affordability, are not new challenges, nor will they be eliminated when we finally crush the virus. And that's why the National Academy of Medicine's focus on these issues is so critically important. By advancing research and sharing concrete policy recommendations, your leadership will improve the lives of individuals, families, and communities across the United States for years to come. I've been honored to work on so many of the initiatives that the National Academy has identified as priorities in for 2021, including healthcare costs and access to affordable care. In fact, when I joined the Department of Health and Human Services during the Obama administration, or before my service in the Obama administration, I worked on the administration uh, and the implementation of the Affordable Care Act under then Secretary Sebelius. In Congress, I've carried that work forward through legislation like my Health Care Affordability Act, which will extend coverage to millions of uninsured Americans and provide significant savings to individuals and families who are struggling with the cost of care. I was proud to see provisions of my bill included in the American Rescue Plan, and I look forward to building on these efforts with other legislation I've introduced to eliminate cost barriers to primary care, mental and behavioral health care, and life-saving treatments and preventive services like insulin. Ensuring that out-of-pocket costs don't stand in the way of people accessing the care they need is essential, but sometimes access to the highest quality care in the world isn't enough. You've probably heard some of the stories by now, Serena Williams, Beyonce, Allison Felix, black women who've had the resources to receive care from the world's greatest medical professionals. And yet all three had harrowing childbirth experiences near misses that threatened their very lives. No amount of education or family support or income was enough to protect these women against the disproportionately high risk facing African-American mothers. I am encouraged to see the National Academy of Medicine focus on our nation's maternal and infant health crisis as one of this year's vital directions priorities. In the health affairs commentary on optimizing health and well being for women and children, authors note that while pregnancy related mortality rates are falling around the world, they are rising in the United States. We now have the highest maternal mortality rate among developed countries. And indeed, my entire lifetime, Maternal mortality in the United States has only worsened, and I am 34 years old. We've also have glaring racial and ethnic disparities in outcomes. Black women are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women, and other women and birthing people of color also suffer from elevated rates of maternal mortality and morbidity. These risks have only grown in the past year. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has found that pregnant people with COVID-19 are at an, an increased risk for severe illness from the coronavirus, and they might be at an increased risk for adverse birth outcomes as well. The solutions, well, they're not a mystery. To protect moms and babies during this pandemic and beyond, we need to take bold multi-sectoral action based on data and evidence that centers the voices of families impacted by this crisis. And when it comes to evidence on maternal health policy solutions, the data are clear. The single best thing that we can do to save moms lives and tackle the glaring disparities is extend postpartum Medicaid coverage from 60 days to one year. Currently Medicaid coverage for postpartum people extends only two months after the end of a pregnancy. Even though we know pregnancy related complications can occur well after 60 days postpartum. In fact, Nearly a quarter of maternal deaths happen more than six weeks after delivery, which is why medical and nursing associations recommend extending postpartum coverage to one year. 
That's why I'm excited about the progress we've made in the past year to advance legislation by Congresswoman Robin Kelly to extend postpartum Medicaid coverage. In September 2020, the House passed the Helping Moms Act with unanimous bipartisan support, which would give states the option of extending coverage for the full year long postpartum period. And the American Rescue Plan will enact this policy on a temporary basis. We're making progress, we're building momentum, but we can't stop until year long postpartum Medicaid coverage is a permanent reality for every mom in every state. But as we see from examples like Beyonce and Serena, saving lives of pregnant people and new moms requires a more systemic solution than expanding healthcare coverage alone. To better understand the broader changes we need to make, I work with Black women-led organizations and families affected by this crisis, nurses, doctors, midwives, community organizations, to assess the evidence base, identify gaps in existing federal policy proposals, and develop legislation to save moms' lives and racial and ethnic disparities and promote true equity and justice for all. And the result is the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act a suite of 12 bills that I introduced last month with Senator Cory Booker and more than 120 of our House and Senate colleagues. Two of these bills are already bipartisan and we hope more will be soon. The 12 bills build on existing legislation to comprehensively address every driver of maternal mortality and disparities in the United States including policies that are closely aligned with the recommendations of the National Academy. For example, the Academy identifies the need to address both clinical and non-clinical factors that influence health outcomes. The Momnibus, it includes policies to provide trainings on bias and racism in maternity care providers, ensuring that clinical care is consistently respectful and culturally appropriate for every pregnant person and new mom. But the legislation also recognizes that social determinants of health like housing and transportation and environmental conditions also impact health outcomes for moms and babies. The Mommy Bus includes funding to ensure that every mom has access to the robust social services that they need and deserve throughout pregnancy and the full year long postpartum period and beyond. One of the most important social determinants is nutrition. And there's robust evidence showing that the WIC program, which provides nutrition support for women, infants, and children, improves health outcomes for moms and babies, and it even reduces mortality. However, many families that need WIC the most, they don't have access to those benefits. The Mommy Bus extends WIC eligibility in the postpartum and breastfeeding periods, ensuring that new moms and their children can receive the nutritional support that they depend on. It also, the Mommy Bus also includes provisions to support women veterans and incarcerated moms, data collection enhancements, investments in the perinatal workforce, funding for digital tools, and policies that specifically address COVID-19. The package also includes policies that are reflected in other vital directions priorities, like transforming mental health and addiction services. Maternal mortality review committees, which are CDC supported initiatives to address the causes of every maternal death within a state have found that mental health conditions are one of the leading causes of pregnancy related mortality. And in my state of Illinois, postpartum opioid overdose deaths have been skyrocketing, which is why we are particularly focused on enhancing and advancing the Moms Matter Act, one of the 12 titles in our bill, and it's bipartisan. Lisa Blunt Rochester from Delaware, John Katko from New York, and Brian Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania are leading that bill. The Moms Matter Act provides robust funding for programs to support pregnant and postpartum people with mental health conditions and substance use disorders, including initiatives to address stigma, provide culturally appropriate services and support, strengthen suicide prevention services, and raise awareness about the warning signs for perinatal mental and behavioral health risks. The bill also provides funding to accredited mental and behavioral health education programs to grow and diversify the workforce, addressing the gaps in care that we see in too many communities across the country, particularly communities of color and other underserved areas. In addition to the Moms Matter Act, we have provisions to support more systematic and comprehensive tracking of maternal suicides, overdose deaths, and prevalence of mental health conditions and substance use disorders. These are the necessary investments that will save lives and support families. I look forward to working with my Democratic and Republican colleagues in the House and Senate 
as well as the Biden-Harris administration to get this legislation signed into law. By deepening our understanding of these issues and proposing solutions to the most pressing health challenges facing our country, the National Academy of Medicine is playing a critical role in the, in the effort to build a healthcare system that's better and better serves every American. I am grateful for the work that you do and for the opportunity to be with you today. I look forward to the day that we're back together in person again, but until then, take good care of yourselves and thanks everybody. Well, thank you very much, Congressman Women Underwood. I mean, we're so lucky to have your leadership. You're championing the important issues and effective legislative change to improve the health of nations. So can you all join me in thanking Bill Frist and the Congressman Underwood for a great talk. So I'm now going to turn the podium over to Adam Weil. Thank you, Victor. It's uh, my pleasure to lead a discussion amongst uh, a terrific collection of panelists. Um, I will tell the audience that we are taking your questions. Uh, I don't know how many we'll get through, but feel free to submit them through the portal as you're uh, right below the screen where you're watching. Um, we're going to hear today from Garth Graham, uh, global, health of, global Head of Healthcare and Public Health at Google YouTube. Uh, Dr. Graham's a cardiologist. He was uh, president of the Aetna Foundation, Vice President of Community, Chief Community Health Officer at CVS Health, has uh, served in two uh, presidential administrations. Um, we're going to hear from Aletha Maybank, inaugural Chief Health Equity Officer and Group Vice President at the American Medical Association. Dr. Maybank was president of the Empire State Medical Association and Deputy and Associate Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We'll hear from uh, Dr. Mark McClellan, Robert J. Margolis Professor of Business, Medicine and Policy, Founding Director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. Uh, Mark has been the Administrator of CMS, the Commissioner of the FDA, um, and he's, uh, as you heard, played a leadership role in the Vital Directions Project. Uh, Laquandra Nesbitt, Board Certified Family Physician, who is the Director of the District of Columbia Department of Health here in Washington, D.C. She's been in that role since 2015. Before that, Director of the Louisiana Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness. And Mark Smith, a professor of clinical medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, visiting professor at the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley, co-chairs the Payment Learning and Action Network uh, that many of us uh, follow the work of, uh, spent uh, almost 20 years as the founding president of the California Healthcare uh, Foundation. Uh, we have uh, five medical doctors being moderated by a lawyer. That's me. So don't <laughs> use your fancy medical terms on me. Uh, we're talking to a lay audience here. I've asked each of you to just kick off with a moment of you've seen the scope of what's covered in the Vital Directions papers. It's obviously very broad. Just like to get a couple of minutes of what pops out to you as a top priority. Uh, that uh, that you would uh, suggest for those who are going to take these papers and turn them into action. And uh, Garth, I'll start with you. Thanks, Alan. I'll try to keep my remarks brief. I think all of the papers touch on the overarching issue of social determinants of health and equity with varied approaches. And I think that has to be um, carried through. I do want to say one thing. I think our, our representative said it well. We have to remember a lot of these issues aren't new. You know, um, uh, the former Surgeon General David Satcher, you know, called out the issue of maternal health, mental health um, issues almost 20 years ago. Secretary Margaret Heckler back in the 1980s talked about in the issue of report that talked about infant mortality and maternal health. So these are these are not brand new challenges. They're, they're, they're perennial and reflective of a lot of the challenges we've been dealing around social issues and um, racial injustice for a long time. So um, with that being said and done, I think the, the papers um, take a different lens on ways in which we can try to address that, certainly um, in the era of COVID. And I think that's important to know. One last thing I'll say, just in the interest of time, um, and I think um, um, uh, Senator Frist said it well, you know, the, 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 the benefits of utilizing technology, telemedicine, um, some of the efforts that we're leading around how you build um, and bring technology to scale, particularly underserved communities, and using things like video. And I think um, that has been accelerated in the era of, of COVID is here to stay. And what we really need to think through 
um, and what I think the papers bring to light, certainly the mental health paper brings to light, but I think is important to understand is um, how we um, evolve where we are with healthcare to where people already are. And, uh, patients, consumers, communities are already utilizing technology um, as a tool in healthcare, despite all of the challenges with access and, and some of the variations there. So we have to uh, make sure that we catch up to where um, communities, um, consumers, patients, um, and uh, the like are, and make sure that we're providing healthcare in that uh, convenient manner. Out of textbooks, you know, taking it out of the doctor's office, out of textbooks, um, you know, out of the kinds of places where people need to go to find the care and bringing care to them. So those are probably the two issues I'd say stood out the most to me. Great, thank you so much for kicking us off. Uh, Aletha, I'll turn to you. Hi, uh, well, thank you, uh, and good to be here uh, with everyone. You know, it's continuing on what, what, what Garth was saying, you know, the reality, all of them mentioned, you know, about equity and talked about equity and the importance of that. And it definitely continues on, you know, with with the focus that has started during a lot of the work that, work, you know, Garth did when he was in a government. The opportunity that I think and, and the need at this point of time is really greater specificity around what it means to actually do equity. I don't feel um, there is enough discussion around the strategies of equity. I think in the previous talk by the Congresswoman, like she definitely uh, elevated some actual strategies, uh, but I don't think we're doing enough of that in our um, spaces of healthcare, uh, especially I'm in the healthcare space, less in the public health space now. But um, I think, you know, we have to better help people understand what it means to do anti-racism, having a praxis around that. Um, and, you know, if I listen to um, uh, Dr. First um, conversation around telemedicine and how a year ago, you know, we didn't really talk about it much and COVID served as this accelerator, you know, it's the same thing as it relates to racism. It's COVID plus the public murder of George Floyd, really, um, that served as this accelerator in talking about racism more so than we have done in probably the last 400 years, let alone, you know, six years. And so, the challenge and the, opp the opportunity is that we're talking about it more so. It's and, and I get it's not equal across the country. I understand that. But we are naming it in ways that we haven't. There are municipalities across the country are now declaring racism is a public health issue and a public health threat. And so how do we turn that into actually institutionalizing it and operationalizing it, I think is really our next phase. And making sure we're naming the context of anti-racism in this progress and this need to advance um, equity. So I'll, I'll stop there for now and I'm sure I'll be able to continue on. That's great. We'll pick up all of these threads. Uh, Mark McClellan, uh, give us your opening thoughts on the papers. Well, thanks, Alan. It's great to be part of the, this uh, distinguished panel. You know, I had the privilege of working with the, the first iteration of Vital Directions back in that 2016-2017 time period. On the one hand, it's uh, maybe concerning that some of the same themes that were important then uh, have come out uh, clearly in the new set of papers and recommendations. And uh, as many of the panelists have already said, you know, many of these, these issues are not new. Uh, what I ap appreciated, particularly from this new set, was uh, number one, there are a number of new perspectives and as a result, new ideas included in this set of recommendations. And number two, there's a real sense of urgency and getting to, if not easy actions to take, at least clear evidence-based directions to address the core challenges of uh, affordability and access to care, uh, making healthcare better so that it really works for populations, and especially, especially putting an emphasis on addressing the disparities that have been highlighted and worsened in the COVID-19 pandemic. And maybe just, just an example of one of these through lines, you heard, uh, um, uh, just uh, uh, recently about all of the legislative efforts underway uh, to try to address maternal health disparities. Well, that was one big theme of the uh, one big practical set of recommendations in this vital directions report, but it's one that carries over across all of the other papers that were included in the uh, whole set. Uh, so uh, on the uh, paper that focused on financing mechanisms, a real emphasis there on changing the way that we pay for healthcare. Again, something we've been talking about for a while, but doing it in a way that focuses on improving population health outcomes for maternal care. Um, so if you apply the ideas of uh, more continuous coverage, 
and also building on what we've learned uh, from efforts like the maternal uh, quality collaboratives on how care can be redesigned to get more upfront support, prevent complications. Um, there's some practical steps for, for implementing that that many states and uh, Medicaid programs and uh, commercial payers are starting to implement. Um, similarly, for uh, steps addressing behavioral health. Well, uh, if we don't integrate behavioral health effectively, uh, we're definitely going to have continuing unmet medical needs. Uh, but as a result of what I think will be some permanent changes from the telehealth expansions that have occurred, uh, we've seen opportunities for making behavioral health better integrated into addressing maternal health problems, depression, uh, other issues, as well as for people more broadly. Um, I do want to emphasize, though, that these steps need to go together. The um, expansion of telehealth by itself without steps to integrate it more effectively with person-based care, uh, good primary care, good uh, population health care supports uh, is likely to just lead to, to higher cost and some significant continuing missed opportunities. Um, same thing for more integrated care for uh, older Americans and for building in better capacities to respond to this pandemic and prevent future outbreaks. Um, the kinds of payment and financing reforms that are included in the report, for example, uh, provide a basis for further steps for health plans, for healthcare providers and public health to work together to address the emerging disparities in COVID-19 vaccination rates that we're seeing. And we saw an announcement from the administration just last week uh, about some steps to track the data uh, with uh, race and ethnicity information too, uh, and support uh, across private health plans and Medicaid and Medicare Advantage, as well as in public, pro, uh, public uh, state and uh, public health programs, uh, ways of uh, identifying gaps in vaccine access and effective strategies for addressing them. It's that kind of coming together that I think really gives the report um, the momentum to have an impact now, uh, just as you've heard from the other panelists. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Laquandra, what's your reaction as someone uh, right out there in the field every single day? Yes, and I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here and to share views and perspectives and also to learn from, from others. And I'm really inspired, as others have said, that the Academy is elevating some of the issues that are so critically important uh, to improving population health, which is a recognition of the social context in which people live and how that influences their ability to be healthy. Um, we have seen uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic how critically important those uh, the need to address those challenges and issues are. Uh, and we're constantly reminding people from the seat that I sit in that the disparities and inequities that we're seeing are not specific or related to the, um, the acute nature of the emerging infectious disease, right? These are things that are happening because we have communities that live under chronic stress. And when shocks come to them, they have a much more difficult time navigating those challenges, navigating that health uh, pandemic, uh, and other things. And so, you know, when we talk about the articles as a collective, it's really, again, inspiring to see that thread of social determinants of health. And it's really inspiring to see how that framing fits into what we need to do for infectious diseases moving forward. Uh, and, you know, just the concept of resilience and truly appreciating that building a resilient response and resilient interventions means that we set up very detailed interventions and strategies that help to mitigate the impact of any stress, whether it be a public health emergency uh, that's caused by an infectious disease, one that's caused by the floods um, that we experienced in this country, or more e recently, the ice storms that happened in Texas that really shook up the infrastructure there. And you know, we can't have a conversation in the public health space about uh, resilience and about the impact of, of COVID-19 uh, without recognizing how these articles help to situate us and prepare us for our post-pandemic framework uh, for dealing with and addressing health. We've had substantial challenges in our public health and healthcare system uh, using our old models of delivery of services. Um, telehealth has already been elevated here, but we see a reduction in people utilizing some of those wraparound services that are meant to improve population health, uh, such as home visits, uh, such as being able to go out to farmer's market using federal vouchers or local vouchers for their food security and food access. 
Uh, and I think we could all agree that the economic impacts um, of this uh, pandemic have been devastating and it will transcend, uh, can transcend any initiatives that aspire to make care more affordable. Uh, locally, and I'll just close with this, with alignment of the articles, we've started to think about our post-pandemic uh, framework for health and it'll be released next month, but we're really looking at five key domains where we can take a look back to what we were doing before February uh, 2020, uh, the things that we've been doing during the pandemic and what infrastructure we really need to have post-pandemic and leveraging so many of the resources that are coming to respond to the pandemic for greater impact long-term. Uh, and those five domains include many of the things that are referenced in the articles as opportunities for improvement and for focus strategies, such as workforce, health information technology, um, healthcare facilities access, health systems planning, when we think about the DC uh, or the Healthy People 2030 program, uh, and even how we deliver our health services, as I mentioned before. So, you know, those are just my, my initial thoughts. Uh, very inspired again to see the Academy elevating this discussion and to see the thread of a recognition of the social context in which people live on their overall health. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And I'll turn last uh, to Mark Smith. Mark. Well, the disadvantage of going last is that everybody said everything, but not everybody's. Uh... So I'll say two things quickly. First of all, a note of caution, because these papers point out the astonishing speed with which things have changed in the last year, things that we never could have imagined, as Dr. Frist said, the degree to which patients and doctors and hospital systems pivoted on a dime to telemedicine. Uh, and we've learned that patients in Vermont being cared for by doctors in New Hampshire do not drop like flies. We've learned that nurse practitioners can do a pretty good job. We've learned that it doesn't really make a difference if a patient has had an in-person contact with a doctor before they have telemedicine. I want to point out there's a reason why all those crazy regulations were in place before this pandemic happened. And in the revolution of telemedicine, we should expect a counter-revolution. For every Napoleon, there's a Louis the 18th. And, and as sure as I've been born, there'll be people who want to go back to the old ways. So it'll be important for us to consolidate some of the lessons from this pandemic. As Mark has said, that ranges everywhere from payment to care delivery to scope of practice to cross-state licensure to all sorts of issues that um, it turns out could be changed in much more quickly than anyone could have imagined. The second is I want to build a little bit on what Dr. Maybag said about the strategies for equity. Um, many of us who are concerned about equity um, are concerned about equity because of a passion for social justice. Uh, and that is right and that is good and should be supported. But there are lots of uh, different political attitudes in our country about social justice. And I should not have to convince you to my view of social justice for you as a healthcare provider or institution to join the fight for equity. Because equity is one of the six domains of quality of the Institute of Medicine, now National Academy. You all know them by heart, say it with me, safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. And equitable is the one that is least often measured, least often paid attention to, but it's the one that every professional should be able to get behind, regardless of their political persuasion, their party affiliation, or their views of social justice. So I think it's going to be important to link the quality improvement agenda, which runs throughout these papers, with the equity agenda, which, as Dr. Maybank has said, is newly rediscovered and I think paid attention to uh, in ways that allow everyone to be involved in the struggle to provide more equitable care to every American, regardless of their political position or their views of social justice. Well, you all have gotten us off to an incredible start. There's so many directions we could go. Let me start with one which goes back to Senator Frist talking about telehealth and uh, Garth, you picked it up, but it's come up a few times. Immediately questions come in. Is it the same quality? Uh, Mark Smith, you touched on that. Uh, is it a tool for equity? It can actually access to broadband can be inequitable. Um, is it just, and maybe this isn't quite the counter-revolution you had in mind, Mark, but is it just a way to continue 
care the way we've always done it just over a TV as opposed to actually moving sites of care and locus of care into homes and communities. So a lot of what was in the vital directions was about changing delivery of care more than just making it virtual. So how do we look at the move to virtual, not just as the end point, but as the way station to really moving care to where people want it, need it, where in their homes, in their communities, how, how, how do we make that happen? And I know you're not a shy bunch. So. <laughs> All right, well, so I believe that every doctor in America five years from now will have to have a four channel practice. They're gonna to have to be able to take care of patients in person by asynchronous communication, tele, you know, emails and texts on the telephone and by video. And we've learned there's an awful lot of stuff that we used to have to do in person, pre-op and post-op and uh, communicating information. IHI, the Leadership Alliance has a principle that says, move data, not people. So I think the, the question is how to have the right site of care for the right patient for the right disease. We will never completely eliminate in-person care, um, but I'll close with, there's an old song by Johnny Mercer that I will paraphrase here. Uh, it is no panacea, but our job, I think, is to accentuate the positive and mitigate the negative. Uh, can it help with discrepancies? Of course it can. Can it help democratize care? Of course it can. Is it perfect? Are there downsides and challenges of broadband and access and everything else? Of course. But the job, I think, for us now is not to kind of endlessly wring our hands about them, is to recognize these issues and, and get to work on mitigating the negative. Garth, it looked like you were going to start. Yeah, I, I love the way um, uh, Dr. Smith said it, said it better than I would, but his point is right. You know, the goal, we realize that there are challenges particularly faced by low-income communities around broadband access and other related um, kinds of challenges. The goal is not to go back. The goal is to figure out how do we bring those communities forward? How do you create infrastructure so that they can have the access and the benefits from all of the technological advances we've talked about with telemedicine, video, um, as, 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 as Dr. Smith said, et cetera. I do love also what Dr. Maybank said, which is, you know, um, getting out of the esoteric and into the, the details is always important. And the details of it is really how we, as a country, think through getting underserved communities to where other communities are in terms of access, not as, as Dr. Smith said, you know, rolling back, um, but more figuring out how we bring communities forward. And, you know, I would just add to that when oftentimes when we talk about telehealth, people think about it, as, as Dr. Smith said, in a very uh, synchronous communication sort of way. Uh, but we've seen greater adoption of the use of home monitoring tools during this period of time. So when we really think about health information technology and health technology more broadly and its ability to help eliminate inequities and to advance the health of vulnerable populations, many of those tools have started to be adopted. People are not afraid of them. And as Dr. Graham said, how do we push on the gas uh, for that? And how do we really, again, looking at the social context in which people live and have meaningful solutions, recognize that increasing broadband access so people can use the tablets that we've given them for free and using their cell phone without worry about cost uh, for minutes for some of these interactions, how do we accelerate that as being part of the health agenda? I'm going to pick up on uh, Dr. Nesbitt's comment about how this is not just about uh, telehealth alone, uh, but really about a whole set of services and supports that can help transform care. And uh, in the pandemic and now uh, be, as we're starting to move beyond it, uh, we are seeing some really innovative models of using telehealth, not as an end in itself, but as a piece of along with uh, data, uh, uh, um, data monitoring remotely, along with using community health workers as a piece of building a really effective care team that meets people where they are, you know, literally in their home and in their community. Um, uh, companies like um, uh, City Block Health uh, that, that work with Medicaid and that do so under these alternative payment models where you're paid you know, for the person, not for a specific type of service alone or a specific channel alone, um, have been able to develop some supports around those 
four channel physicians. Uh, uh, turns out uh, you got a lot of physicians on this panel. You, you don't necessarily need a lot of physicians to deliver uh, really good care if you give a care team uh, the right supports and really help them focus on meeting people where they are. So even if you don't have a city block, I think would tell you, if you don't have broadband in the home, even if a person you know, doesn't have a, a smartphone and can't easily um, isolate themselves, you know, get some privacy to have that, uh, uh, that good telehealth um, uh, um, uh, encounter, you can still use technology to support connecting with that person. It just has to be specialized to the particular needs of that individual. And that's why I think it's so important that we support, as the Vital Directions papers emphasize, this shift in the way that we're paying for care, not, not just to, to, to move to capitation or to move towards new payment models for their own sake, but to really track what is working and that people are experiencing care better, that they're getting their behavioral health concerns addressed, that they're able to stay on the right medications because they've got a secure enough home environment and the, uh, and the uh, social uh, factors that, are, that, are, that make it so difficult for some people to, to take advantage of care are being addressed. So I think there's a lot to build on here um, as, as these other uh, panelists have mentioned. I just want to um, add in, you know, my, my role is, you know, equity and just, I agree with all that was said. And I agree with the context that we have a good understanding of kind of the descriptive aspects of where inequities exist. And there's always more to learn. Um, and that shouldn't get us caught up on not moving forward. However, I think important to move forward and to really hold true to an equity lens we need to kind of move more upstream in how we talk about telehealth and the technology and all these um, pieces of innovation that are emerging at this time that help with healthcare delivery to make sure that we're not exacerbating equity, but also that we're not excluding. And so, and, and it's not just about like the connective connectivity and device and all of that, but it's about the design and how do we get to the design moment? You know, oftentimes really, you know, there's exclusionary design and it really fails to center solution development that's really on historically marginalized communities up front because they're not part of that development. And I think there are more opportunities across the country to actually connect those dots between the opportunities for innovation and what's happening at the neighborhood level where there are great ideas around solution, really relevant ideas around solution. But then the question is like who gets funded and who doesn't get funded for you know, their ideas. And so we're doing a lot of work of really trying to push upstream to kind of look where um, we can push more so, I guess, you know, this, the, the business sector um, to really challenge, you know, the lenses that they're, they're moving forward to do this work and, and who are they funding. And so we now have more um, engagement with venture um, entrepreneurs, all, all, all the folks within that particular ecosystem to really start support development um, within the sector that prioritizes resource allocation to launch and scale solutions that are meaningful for advancing um, health and racial and social justice, but also really ensuring that um, folks who are of color um, and uh, you know identify across the spectrum of identity have opportunities to engage with these venture folks also, they have the uh, opportunity to engage with investors as well who will fund their, their products because there's a huge gap um, in that area. And I think that usually gets left out of the kind of tech telehealth conversation. How do we move more upstream? I want to follow up on that with your comment at the opening around uh, specificity and strategy. So Congress just sent to the president a $1.9 trillion uh, a piece of legislation that's designed to help move us uh, forward here. Um, seems like a great opportunity to address the five areas in the papers, it, uh, but it obviously was not uh, written uh, just with that in mind. What specific opportunities do you see either having been uh, taken a good start, uh, a, a good first step in the legislation that was enacted? If you were Thinking about what comes next, what would come to mind at the level of, of sustained uh, efforts uh, to, to try to address some of the issues in the Vital Directions papers? 
Yeah, let me let me start off and jump in. Um, you know, Dr. Maybank and team wrote a, a very interesting um, op-ed um, around an African American physician who had passed away, um, potentially due to the impact of of systemic racism and certainly um, uh, uh, the, the concept of explicit, not even implicit bias. And though the the current law has a lot around supporting community health centers and the kinds of things that we've done for a long time in health policy. Um, and, and, and new things around testing and expanding and trying to get underserved communities. One of the things I thought was not was not there and also was not, I think, explicitly brought out in the papers is this issue of addressing explicit and implicit bias and ways in which we think through that. It shows up a lot around maternal health. Um, Dr. Wallace, um, a physician who passed away um, from uh, maternal health complications in Indiana and so many other examples of names of people that we can think through how bias gets its way into healthcare and, and has a very profound outcome. And um, again, you know, really um, hats off to um, Dr. Maybank and team who've kind of written a lot more about this, but that's one area I think I would like to see it more, more explicitly explored given the time, given the, the consciousness and we have the ability and capability to discuss it a little bit more now. That's a, yeah. So I would I would add to that that I think you know in terms of the legislation that was passed, uh, we definitely think that anything that helps with the economic situation of families, uh, because of economics, employment opportunities, et cetera, is such a key driver of health outcomes uh, in our community and our society would be beneficial. Um, to to Dr. Maybank's point, however, the implementation of the legislation and how the responsible agencies set up what those requirements are. Uh, for all of the jurisdictions that may be receiving funding, whether it be around vaccination rollout, whether it be about supports to community health centers, et cetera. If we don't reimagine how we provide services and if we don't figure out how to make equity the priority or at a minimum pair equity and efficiency together, have them be parallel constructs as opposed to equity always being that we'll get to it if we can, um, we're not going to realize the true potential of, of this legislation. I think we have to recognize that our health systems, public health and healthcare systems have been changed permanently. Uh, some of them have lost capacity because they had to make adjustments to their physical plant just to be able to manage COVID-19 patients. So they couldn't possibly even see the same volume of individuals in person as they were being pre-pandemic. And that requires substantial investment in the pipeline for the health workforce uh, and that that workforce be very diverse. Uh, we're not talking about continuing to ramp up funding and health professional loan repayment programs that skew to physicians, but thinking very intentionally about how we invest in allied health, how we invest in, in uh, for community health workers and not have them bound so much to the fee for service payment system uh, in terms of their interaction and engagements, both on the public health and healthcare side. Uh, so those are the types of things that when you are looking at different jurisdictions that are along the spectrum, uh, some doing a much better job than others with the rollout of their vaccine, a program, for example, from an equity perspective, the ones who have really embraced uh, the use of um, allied health professionals or expanding scope of practice or being very detailed oriented in their review of data to get down to the neighborhood level as to where health needs are, are doing a much better job than those who are still taking sort of that macro and meso view. Uh, so I, I think that we have to be very intentional that when this legislation is implemented, it comes with the right reporting requirements and the right enforcement tools uh, for jurisdictions to use these funds responsibly. Some of the most important uh, elements of the um, legislation that President Biden just signed were for improving health and health equity were not the healthcare provisions, but the uh, the economic provisions. I'd particularly point out the um, big expansion of the, the child tax credit, which is going to make a big difference in uh, the lives of kids in um, low-income households and underserved communities, and hopefully something that we can build on over time. It's, an, it's a concept that's had a lot of bipartisan support, even though it's not one that is likely to show some short-term impacts on, on health outcomes. It might, uh, but certainly a lot of potential for the future. And I'd be interested in Mark Smith's view on this. We, uh, Mark and I had a chance to talk a number of times about how much uh, is really within the healthcare 
purview versus outside. I do think, thanks to the legislation, like Dr. Nesbitt said and, and, and others, there are some specific opportunities to use public health funding in the legislation paired with steps in healthcare systems, uh, you know, meeting people where they are and going more upstream to make a bigger difference. Um, take um, vaccination as an example. Um, in uh, Here in North Carolina, our state is requiring uh, submission of um, race and ethnicity information uh, with the vaccination registration system. So it's a core part of public health. You don't submit it, you don't get paid. And uh, also is uh, tying those measures to the allocation of vaccines. Not that the measures by themselves tell you how to address disparities, but they can tell you that certain approaches like uh, working with community organizations uh, can, can uh, make a difference and working with community-based providers rather than maybe just relying on large mass vaccination sites. And so, um, uh, for example, uh, we've done some work. I work with the National Alliance for Hispanic Health. Uh, they've got some good examples of models that are, that are helpful in addressing uh, concerns about um, access and about uh, questions about vaccines in the Latinx communities that can be built into these models working with healthcare providers. I think if we have measures that share the same goals, increase vaccination, reduce uh, maternal health disparities outside of healthcare and in public health programs and inside of uh, our reform healthcare programs that uh, aren't just being paid on a fee-for-service basis, but are, but are being held accountable and given new supports to address uh, health disparities. I think we can make some progress there too. So steps both inside of healthcare, um, including public health upstream steps, as well as uh, important attention to the steps beyond healthcare that matter so much. Yeah, I'm all for upstream. The spidey sense in the back of my neck gets a little irritated when I start hearing hospitals saying they're going to take on housing and transportation and food deserts and all the rest of that. So I think it's important that we focus resources on social determinants. Also think it's important that we be aware of the power dynamics that exist in lots of communities. And so when you're talking about triaging access to scarce resources, I want to make sure that that triage doesn't happen from the perspective of what's best for the healthcare system, but what's best for the people and community. And sometimes those priorities are not quite the same. So I'm all for the concept, but as you've heard people say uh, in another context today, the devil's in the details about how exactly that gets done. Absolutely. And I also think, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I think it's, it's also in our kind of just guiding principles around what equity is and what it means. Um, you know, I usually refer to Kamara Jones and just saying, you know, we value all people, right? And people could say, yeah, we do that, but does that really play out in your systems and your structure? That there's a recognition that there's a historical context to why your system has ended up the way it has. Are you really looking into that and the, the relationships that you've had with your, your neighborhoods, whether you're a public health system or a healthcare system? And then as, as Mark just mentioned, you know, the redistribution of resources, which is absolutely critical you know, to an equity approach, and that really gets missed uh, upon people. And so, you know, while um, I understand folks' hesitation in terms of healthcare, focusing or addressing issues like housing, the reality is, is that most people within the space of healthcare anyway in medicine are not well equipped um, to even understand these contexts that are upstream and then what to do with it. And so it speaks to in terms of solutions, um, we need a, a, a a more diverse uh, healthcare workforce, I think that's absolutely true, um, and, and racial ethnic diversity, I wanna just point that out uh, along with other things. But also we need a, a workforce that even understands what public health concepts are about, understands principles around equity and how to, to operationalize. I just feel at this time, we don't have a lot of people who really have a skill set of the institutionalized, how to do it when needs to be done differently, you know, again, institutionalized. What are those questions that you have to ask yourself to ensure that you are not discriminating, exacerbating inequities or denying care in any kind of way? You know, are you asking yourselves about who you are engaging? I would say on the healthcare side, these questions don't get asked enough. And then also like who is benefiting and burdening, being burdened by the proposal and the ideas that are you putting forward? These are concrete strategies and, and tools rather 
that people can use in order to do this equity work. And I think the opportunity is, is how do we get more people kind of equipped in that space? Um, because if not, we are going to be, from my perspective, we're going to be going in circles. We're going to be saying equity, 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 we need to do this, but we don't have a workforce that's really um, skilled and equipped to really know how to do that. And then lastly, I'll just mention, I think the other tremendous opportunity to um, really institutionalize equity is the executive order um, for this administration on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities throughout the entire government. So that uh, allows for, for several things. Um, one, just understanding that it's not just you know a health thing that clearly needs to have racial equity embedded across all aspects and agencies, um, but it also provides an infrastructure for sustainability of this work. Uh, and I think that I get concerned a lot about that as well. I think we have an opportunity to really embed it into kind of practice and culture of federal government so that it lasts over time. And we see the budding work, you know, we'll see what happens, you know, with United NIH, um, you know, that they launched their initiative to address structural racism um, and really focused on, you know, the, the policy aspect and the structural aspect within their organization to make sure that it's embedded. I feel like you've brought together so many themes and I'm going to try to weave them a bit and get one last set of comments from each of you. Uh, the concept of workforce, which often is just counting numbers of people, uh, now has, uh, has come up in so many different dimensions in this conversation. How people practice, the diversity of the workforce, the ability to function in teams, the uh, knowledge of public health, the, uh, the need of people with different levels of training, but then also that the right workforce is part of institutionalizing change, that it's the people and how they interact with each other that are the institution. And so that leads me back to the very first comment, which was about uh, sustaining change, that the issues actually identified in vital directions are not new. They're the perennial, perennial issues. And the question is, how do we have a sustained response this time that leads us to, as, as uh, Mark said, uh, having been involved in this uh, four years ago, you know, you don't want, we don't want to have this conversation four years from now, the same one. We want to be in a different place. So let's weave together some of these threads of workforce, institutional change, and the desire to do better. And what advice do you give to those who are in policymaking positions uh, so that we're not back here four years from now having the same conversation? I think the most important thing is data. Um, I think if um, every every line of business, every institution, every organization, every company ought to think about what its most important quality metric is, and then analyze it by the axes that we know have this, this disparities in them. A hospital ought to be analyzing its readmission rate by race. An ER ought to be analyzing its satisfaction with pain control by gender. Um, a, a health insurance plan ought to be or, uh, analyzing its uh, net promoter scores, or hospitals can do their press skinny scores by uh, primary language. So I don't, I don't think it requires the creation of a whole new data set. I think it requires an, what someone called an equity lens. Um, and I think that's the way we can institutionalize uh, a way of seeing what progress we're making and identifying areas where we could make more progress. You know, Alan, I, I agree that we are at a very pivotal, pivotal moment where what we do right now at this tipping point matters in terms of setting our system on a different trajectory that can be sustained over time. And, you know, I, I hate to keep going back to this, but I really think that the more we recognize that investments in non-healthcare activities are investments in the improvement of health if they're the right investments. And we put together a framework here, even thinking about, you know, when we every state has talked about reopening, uh, we have a, uh, an approach that says we have to focus on health, opportunity, prosperity, and equity. And so for all of the domains and all of the sectors that were impacted by the global pandemic, so our, our large employers, our trans, transit system, everything has to do their new work around what does it look like, what's a reimagined DC uh, through the lens of health opportunity, prosperity, and equity. Uh, so practically, 
uh, when we're engaging with our policymakers, whether it be the executive or the legislative branch, we're very uh, keen on acknowledging where investments in other sectors have an opportunity to improve health, as opposed to focusing sh simply on the size of the budgets for the Medicaid agency and their population health initiatives, the size of the, the health department and its population health initiatives, but really doing a good job of weaving that in. And the more people buy into that concept, the greater sense of permanence it creates, and the more it depoliticizes some of the things that we talk about in terms of health reform, uh, in terms of, uh, um, in terms of health reform and payment reform that often can be dismissed as as mark said every evolution has a revolutionary and so or uh, again a revolution has a has an opponent rather uh, and so i think that we really need to be mindful of why we haven't accomplished what we want to so far uh, and being very hypersensitive uh, to what those potential barriers are so we can have reasonable and practical responses and solutions when they arise The one other thing I would add is Congressman Lou Stokes, who uh, many of you may know as kind of one of the old fathers of the Congressional Black Caucus, and he'd always sit down a group of us and tell us what mattered um, so that you don't focus your time on things that don't matter. And he always said, laws, policies, and regulations start there. And then he said, if we can get the big health equity things into laws, into the actual policies, that's how he created the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Aspirators, which has now funded all kinds of research um, around the around the world, um, was you know he he moved that law forward, um, and, and he created that law, I should say. And so I think to the degree that we can sit back right now and have distinct, actual legal and, and uh, grow on the current legal infrastructure, but distinct actual legal policies and and parameters that advance the field. I think then it's harder to take a step back once you kind of uh, make those moves. Yeah. I'd like to put an emphasis in making those legal and now and with, with some new legislation, now a lot of opportunities in the regulatory side for implementing these policies to put emphasis on Mark's point about measurement. It's hard to measure everything that we care about when it comes to equity and population health and these other complex issues. Uh, but that is a way to make sure we're not losing the focus. So whether it's in making progress on COVID uh, around tracking um, race, ethnicity measures, and maybe other socioeconomic measures related to vaccination use, or to test positivity rates, or to um, access to monoclonal antibodies or other effective treatments for uh, high-risk individuals who are infected. Uh, that's a way of helping to bring together the, the healthcare or mining people on the healthcare side that they can't alone address these upstream issues, but maybe need to form partnerships and respect uh, that sharing of power, as, as Mark said, with what it's really gonna take to address those issues. Same thing is true with some of the other uh, issues that we talked about today. If, uh, um, if uh, Representative Underwood's uh, legislation could also include some accountability for actually bringing down uh, disparities in maternal outcomes, uh, think about how that could help be a, a galvanizing force for making sure that we're we really are making progress. You know, we've had healthcare 2020 goals, healthcare 2030 goals, and so on. Many of which, as uh, Garth knows, we used to work on these together. <laughs> have equity components in them, but if they're not linked to action steps and accountability, I don't think you're really going to get change. I think the good news is coming out of these papers and what will hopefully be an ongoing National Academy of Medicine uh, commitment in these areas is that we do have policies that include these steps towards accountability, measurement, and really seeing if we're making progress. That's, and I completely 100% agree with that. I, I don't think we can fully do equity work well and really say we're doing it if we don't have accountability to it. And we need policy that helps support <clears throat> that effort because folks don't just naturally get up and do equity work. It just, it doesn't happen. We can have it from a value context um, and we can have it from a good intention context, but if we don't actually have impact, then we're not really doing it. And so I think the point of data, absolutely. The point of accountability is absolutely critical as well. I also think the other opportunity in terms of infrastructure and this awareness, public health has always been aware of this, but I think this now awareness in, on the healthcare side, it's kind of um, aligning and moving up to where public health has been. 
is that we have this opportunity and this the switch of understanding that health is all policy is health policy basically and that there is an opportunity to now try to operationalize things like health and all policies you know where we it really has not been able to you know have any kind of legs here in the united states maybe in some places like california and certain entities in different places but not like it has um, internationally in some countries and i think if we want to think about sustainability we need to have a governance structure um, and an infrastructure at the federal level and policy that states that these organizations need to work together to and towards um, goals that are shared as well as metrics and performance um, um, opportunities that are shared and i think that that could move us closer to working across the board and bringing in the context of health as a lens but also equity as a lens well i know it isn't fair to bring this up with moments to close but i do have to say that it's striking the emphasis on whether you use the term social determinants or moving upstream. When you talked about, a number of you talked about the legislation on the president's desk, which I guess maybe it's been signed. I didn't, I, I'm too far away from my, uh, my phone to know um, that, that many of you emphasized the importance of the economic provisions. The room to pay for those comes from the sense that we're in a national crisis if we're not in a national crisis, the room to pay for those is probably going to need to come from healthcare, uh, since that's a major competitor for resources. So even as we talk about all of the new agendas we have, we are going to have to have those conversations in the context of some fiscal constraint uh, that's imposed, whether it's through government budgeting processes or private sector choices. Uh, we, we can't forget that dimension of the vital directions looking at cost as a contributor to equity. Um, but as I say, it's a little unfair to throw that out uh, right as we're closing. Um, I just want to say my uh, thanks to all of you for incredible perspective, uh, richness of conversation. Uh, the opening question, if you will, was, are the vital directions set forth in these papers the ones that uh, should help guide the country and how can we uh, uh, provide good advice to our policymakers? And I think uh, you've shown the, the strong platform that they provide and also provided some really important nuance and additional perspective on what it's going to take to make them uh, achieve their goals. So I'm, I'm grateful to you all for your time and participation. And again, if we were in a room right now, I would ask for a rousing uh, round of applause. And instead, I will applaud on your behalf and say uh, thank you. And um, just uh, as we come to a close, I, I want to say how pleased we are at Health Affairs to have been able to publish these papers coming out of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, we work at the intersection of health and healthcare and health policy, and that's exactly what uh, we've been talking about here. And uh, I now get to turn it back with a personal thanks to you, Victor, uh, for your leadership of the National Academy, of which I'm a proud member, but of this Vital Directions Project and your overall emphasis on making sure that the work of the National Academy of Medicine is relevant to policy and policymakers. Uh, you've you've uh, moved that uh, so far forward, and uh, it's just been great to work with you, uh, not just in this capacity, but in others. So with uh, thanks to you and to your excellent team, uh, I'll turn it back to you for some closing words. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Alan, and I want to thank this wonderful panel and our speakers, special speakers, for a really great afternoon. I've learned so much. You know, when you think about our name, National Academy of Medicine, it really hardly reflects our aspiration. We're more than an academy, although we found it as an academy. We're more than medicine. We're about health. So I think what we heard today, I just feel we're so privileged to serve this nation, to serve our people, and to serve globally. And as we reflected today, the vital directions is what we hear from all of you. Uh, this is not put out of the air. This, in fact, is through hard work and hearing from the nation, from people. What are those issues that we all have to address together? And I do want to thank my co-chair, Mark McClellan, and of course, Mike McGinnis, my executive officer, 
really to pull together this wonderful set. And Jessica Marks, our staff, who's really worked tirelessly to put it together. Today's discussion, and particularly the last panel, to me is truly inspirational. Everything you said is so, so important. And we recognize that we as a nation, as society, need to work together. I think you've made this point many times. And to achieve equity really is not only health equity, but it's been said it's through the lens of health, but in every single sector. And the thoughtfulness and the arguments you make and the recommendations you make are so well put together that we will, as the National Academy of Medicine, take these ideas forward. And certainly want to engage all of you and many others to be sure that, as you say, four years from now, we don't have the same conversation. We all like to see, in fact, this progress. I know that, as the famous Chinese saying says, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. We're taking those steps together. So I just want to thank the panel again, the speakers, Alan, for a wonderful afternoon. I know there are 1,500 people who logged on this webinar, and I know they were inspired by many of the ideas and comments we made today. So again, a heartfelt thanks from me on behalf of National Academy of Medicine and everything else that we represent. Thank you.